it's you. I know you. Yes, they've sent me here to help you have a nice relaxing bath. And what was your name again? Cinder... Ella. Ella is your real name. And Cinder is what they call you, Cinderella. Yes, so what are you doing here in the, in the castle, in the princess castle? You no, know, they've told me very little. They've told me just to come and that there was a woman here who needed my help. And it's you. You're going to take a royal bath. I see. The prince brought you here. He doesn't want you living with your stepmother anymore. I understand she wasn't very nice to you. But you're going to dinner with the prince and his family tonight. I see. And we need to be clean. And all ready. You don't have a lady's maid, right? I know. I know, Cinderella. I know that you came from a hard time. What's that? Well, they did tell me that tonight, as a fairy godmother, I would be helping out somebody very special and that I would be helping her to take her first royal bath. They didn't tell me it was you. They just told me to hurry on over. But I want to tell you, I decided to stop in the future and pick up a few bath products. Yes, they have these in the future. So many lovely things, Cinderella. I think you will be very happy. I just, why don't you go ahead and step into the bubble bath that I have, that I have prepared. That's it. Step in and we'll get started. I am very happy to be your lady's maid for the evening, even though I am actually a fairy godmother. But I love my entire job except for the pay. They pay us in mushrooms. I like mushrooms. Sometimes they taste very good. But when I went to the future and tried to pay in mushrooms, well, you can imagine how that went. Anyway, I thought we would start out with a cup of tea. Yes, I know I had them bring the copper tub over here by the fire. I hope that's okay, so I'm just gonna hand you this tea. All right, there you are. Do you've got it? Are you laid back there? Very good, very good. Now, how shall we start? I have so many things. First of all, I want you to know that this one was made by an apothecary here in this era. And it's rose bath salts, which I have already put in the water for you. Yes, and I've already put in two, one of these fizzy balms. This was also made by the local apothecary. I did not have to go to the future for this one. So, how would you like to start? You don't know because you've never had anybody help you in the bath before. Then please relax, Cinderella, because you know you deserve it. You deserve all of this. Yes, you deserve a wonderful, relaxing evening. So let me just say, we can go ahead, and in the future they have something called shampoo. Yeah, shampoo. So I thought. Maybe we could go ahead and try what? It's for your hair. No, you don't need it. No. It, it has a very cute name though. Shampoo. 
I like it quite a bit. So I thought we could go ahead and get started. Then go ahead and wash your hair first. Will that be okay? What's that you say? It's hard to hold your teacup and be in the bathtub. You can just go ahead and set it right there on the side table there. There you are. are beautiful. How did they get to be the queen that you borrow her maid? And the maid did that for you? They look so nice. Rinse it off. If you just want to tilt your head back, and I'm going to just gently, yeah. Just, if you just tip back, that's it. There you go. Yeah. Let's pour a little bit more on there to rinse it off. Is the temperature? Is the temperature okay? Good. Good. I'm glad to hear it. So now you have to tell me. How did you come to be here? Yeah, you got a little bit more soap. Let me just go ahead and rinse that off. How did you come to be here at the castle? The last I saw of you, you were going off in your pumpkin carriage. I had just converted your mice into horses. That was so fun. And your horse into a footman. So I take it that the ball went okay? No, they never tell me anything at headquarters. Wonderful. And you met the prince and he was very nice. And then you left at midnight like I told you. Oh, you had to run down the stairs. And you lost a shoe. <gasps> well, at least you made it back safe and sound and it sounds like you made a good friend. Okay, so. You have to tell me all about it, but I do want to move along a little bit. I have brought several bath products back from the future. This one we can use to wash your whole body, and it says that it smells like peaches and mimosa. Uh, or I have this one. This one is 
cherry blossom and tea rose. That would be nice. Or I have lavender, which will make you sleep like a baby afterwards. You want to go with the peaches? They might really like that when you show up at the dinner table. Will you be with the prince and his father, the king and the queen? No, no pressure there. Yeah, I'm so happy. So you and the prince became friends. Wonderful. He did what? He sought you out with the shoe that you left behind. Oh, and when he found you with that mean family, then he moved you here. Oh, and that's how come you're here. And that's how come you're getting ready for this special dinner tonight. Ah, and then you and the prince might get to know each other. And we shouldn't expect romance or... Oh, well, I'm going to hope so. What do you mean? You're just a simple woman, but he's just a simple man. You never know. Let me go ahead. And let me lather up my hands, and then I will help you wash. you like to? I know that royalty doesn't very often lather themselves, but it might be nice to Would you like to? You do, yeah. You're used to doing things for yourself. I know. I know. Even though you deserve a break. Everybody deserves a break. In fact, I'm going to pass this to you. Use it as you wish. And then, go ahead and lather up. And if you lean in, I will gently wipe your face. Will that be okay for you? Okay. Let me go ahead and gently mean to bother you while you're lathering up, but what happened to your little mice? Uh, the butler stopped them. At the door, he wouldn't let them in. I will speak to the prince and the king and the queen and let them know that your mice are good mice and that they should be allowed in the castle as well. All right? There. Oh, I see you're very you are, you're very soapy. So, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to scrub your back for you. Will that be okay? Yeah. So I have this wonderful scrubber. Also from the future. Let's go ahead. Got it wet here a little bit. And let's go ahead. stepsisters but it won't fit oh I'm gonna have to get in there and really scrub you clean ready all right how's that feel just really scrub me clean does it feel good it feels 
good on my hand. I think it would feel good on your back. Just keep scrapping it clean. So your stepsisters, he tried it on each of your stepsisters. That their feet were too big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and your mice had to let you out of the attic because your stepmother had locked you in. Oh, goodness. I tell you. Your godmothers who are mean to me, yeah? Yeah. I have to tell you that most fairy godmothers are extremely good looking. I mean, these women are pulled together, and if they aren't, they can just abracadabra themselves and make themselves just absolutely stunning. I have let to yet to learn that skill. So, I just, you know, kind of plain Jane too. Not like you. You're stunning. But, and they are so nasty. You should hear the things they say. They always say to me, why can't you fix your nose? It's too wide for your face. They say that just like that. I think that it's good to be true to who you are, to who we are. Yeah, even you. Society's so-called imperfections, right? I just say, Ignore the nasty remarks. So, the mice let you out. Wonderful. Wonderful. And then what happened? Ah. Your stepsister tripped you as you were going to try on the shoe. Oh. No. Whatever, whatever it is that you want. So, what is it that you would like for dinner? Oh, yes. Oh, yum. That sounds delicious. Oh, I would like that for dinner too. Oh, let me let me write that down. And what else is it that you would like? Oh, mm, yes. <gasps> that sounds delicious. that peaches and you smell like peaches and okay well I'm sure that that will make a wonderful meal wait you have a what oh yeah yeah oh delicious an apricot souffle oh I think that would be yummy too going to do this and deliver it to him like that. So I'm so sorry. I, you were telling me about your stepsister tripping you and you falling and breaking your shoe and then all of a sudden I remembered about the chef and asking me um, what you would like to eat and then I didn't listen to how oh, all that got resolved. Oh. You pulled the other shoe out of your pocket. And he knew it was you. And and then he invited you to, to pack up your things and come here, but you had nothing. And he, well, you know what? I think I can whip you up a dress for tonight. Yes, we won't send you down to dinner in rags. But I have a few more things that I got from the future. Would you like to see them? Oh, the future is a marvelous place. Yes, but they have their problems there too. They haven't completely caught it figured out yet. But what they do have is this watermelon foot peel. So 
these are just little things that if you stick your feet up on the edge of the tub, I'm going to drape these over your feet and it's going to make them so soft and smooth. Absolutely fabulous. So I'm going to go ahead and put it on. I'm going to put on the scrub and then I'm going to put these little booties on over it. And it will keep your feet all nice and moisturized. So let me go ahead and, and get some of the scrub. my hands again and then I'm going to go ahead and if you could just turn so you could put your foot up a little at the end there there we go yeah just one foot right in there that's it and then we'll just go ahead and tie this that on there and now you'll just have to sit still for a little bit. Can I have the other foot please? So I mean what do you think the prince's intentions are? You don't know. You're just getting to know each other. Oh, I'm sorry I have to keep adjusting my shift. I need a lady's pants too. It's so hard to wear these ball gowns. There's the undergarment, and then the ball gown, and the shift, and it's just a lot. So, now while we're doing that, I am going to go ahead. I brought this back from the future, too. It is a comb, but not like we have here. Not a wood kind. Doesn't it make a lovely noise? I think it's just lovely. out your wet hair or just comb out your wet hair so that it doesn't dry off all the things in it. Honey 
all mixed up in here. And we're just gonna go ahead and pour it on. Yeah. Just gonna go ahead and pour that on. And then we'll scrub. I'm gonna scrub it in really good again with my wonderful brush and this is going to help gently exfoliate your skin which I know because you have never been treated very well you probably don't even know what exfoliating your skin means but it's just going to get on any dead skin and make your whole body feel fresh and clean and smooth. dirt off. I know you get so dirty from having to clean that chimney or whatever you do you have to oh, you have to clean your whole, that whole house. Well now your stepmom and stepsisters will have to do that themselves. Okay so I'm just gonna go ahead and rinse you off. Will that be all right? Then we'll get you I'll get a towel we'll get you out we'll get you dressed. And afterwards, I'm going to help you get into bed. After you go to dinner tonight, I'll help you get into bed and I will tell you a bedtime story. Will that be okay? Okay, so yeah, let me go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and rinse you all off here. Yeah. I know, it's kind of sticky the honey and the sugar. So I'll just, I'll just pour it on here. Yes. How is that? Yeah. You know what? This has been my pleasure. It really has been. I really, I love all the time that I spend with my, my godchildren, my fairy godchildren. You're all so special. There, a little bit more right there, okay. Wonderful. Alrighty, let me, let me just get you a towel, dear lady. Hold on just one second, okay. So I have a towel for you. Alright, do you want to go ahead and stand up? Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cinderella for letting me be part of this. Well, it's me, Cinderella. How was, how was your, uh, how was your dinner with the prince and his family? I took the liberty of having uh, the maid set out a nightgown for you. Here it is. didn't make it. No, she found it and she had it set up for you. Isn't it beautiful? So, why don't you go ahead and put it on? I won't look. Yeah, it's me. I have my nightgown on too. I hope you don't mind. But it's getting late and the ball gown is so uncomfortable. So why don't you go ahead and crawl into bed and tell me, did you have a nice time? Wonderful time. And the prince is going to help you find your own little cottage to move into. And you're going to go to school. That's wonderful. Your stepmother won't let you go to school even. And you want to become a nurse. I think you're going to make a marvelous nurse. You must be so excited. You are excited. 
and you're finding it a little bit hard to sleep because the prince asked you out to another ball next weekend. Oh, that's wonderful. 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 Okay, well, I'll be happy to tell you a little story. Yeah, it's not my forte. I must admit, when you told me that they tripped you on the stairs, I was so sad and that they broke your... your... your stepsisters broke your glass shoe. I was very sad. I know. I contemplated turning them into skunks. But Mother Superior says that's not nice. Yes, Mother Superior. Oh, Kitty's here. Mother Superior is what we call the head of the fairy godmothers. And she's kind of severe. Yeah. In fact, she says that even when we sleep, we have to wear our fairy godmother tiara. It gets really See, you wanted me to tell you a story. Okay. Sure, I can do that. Yes, go ahead and lay down. Close your eyes. Relax. 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 And yeah, I'm going to tell you a story about gerbils because you seem to be so fond of your rodent friends. This is a story about a mighty set of gerbils. A pack of gerbils. I'm not exactly sure what the group noun is for gerbils. I'm going to have to look that up sometime. Anyway, shall we start? Okay. Elise de Sori was born in a litter of five in a chateau high up in the Alps of France overlooking the Cerulean Lake of Grenoble. Outside, the wind howled and snow fell in fat petals to shroud the entire valley in a mist of white. Elise remembered none of it, snuggled up with her brothers and sisters against the warmth of her mother. She remembered nothing of the hand that picked her up, stroked her, and then placed her in a matchbox lined with downy feathers. Nor did she remember being carried down the stone steps of the castle to an awaiting carriage. There ensued a long trip across bumpy roads and borders and time. Abruzzo was far, but she was only six weeks old and so she did not remember the journey either. You have brought us the right one? Asked a gerbil named Giotto, who crawled out from a hole in the Torre di Mondi, perched on a cliff outside the sleepy hamlet of Penipie di Monte. I have, sir, said a man, dressed head to toe in black, who stepped from the carriage pulled by five dappled mares. The man bent down and opened the matchbox. See, she has a stripe down her back of pure white, a sign she was born under the sword star. She is destined to become a knight. She will help the Templars. It is what you want, yes? You have foreseen this, Lupo? I have, Joto. You are good for a human, as are you for a rodent. If only all our knights were so easy to find as this little one. If only the world were full of peace, then there would be no need for knights. Good night, Giotto. Buona notte, Lupo. Far across time and oceans, Otis was born. His birth was not as grand as that of Elise de Sury, and was therefore never recorded. Otis's first memory was of a hand, a dark one, with short, chubby fingers reaching through silver bars to grab him. The fingers clamped about him like five wriggling snakes, and he did what must be done. He bit. I am rage, he roared, 
but to the humans in attendance, it came out as a squeak. The owner of the chomped finger dropped Otis so that he landed with a thud on the formica. A drop of blood oozed from the open wound as screams registered all around from both the humans in attendance as well as Otis. He's not used to being held, that is all, said a professorial sort of man dressed in a suit with a polka dot bow tie. You mustn't cry, Thomas. Thomas was small, no more than four in human years. He held up his hand and another drop of blood oozed scarlet from the wound. It was a small injury, but Thomas howled as fierce as the north wind. He held so long, one might have thought Otis had done something much graver to him than a simple chomp on the finger. Despite such inauspicious beginnings, Otis and Thomas eventually tamed each other. Like all taming processes, be humans and beasts, this began by observation, preferably from a distance. Over the next few months, Otis and Thomas spent many hours staring at each other from opposite sides of the silver bars of the cage Otis shared with his mother Maeve. Otis found Thomas curious looking. He did not have much fur except for a mop of unruly curls which cascaded hurly-burly style from the top of his head. The rest of his body was dark-skinned, a rather lovely color, like chocolate and coffee, and all things the good knights of Abruzzo was later introduced to Otis. For his part, Thomas provided Otis with a fine home full of shredded paper and clear plastic tunnels that twisted this way and that. Thomas's father, Arthur, continued to set up more tunnels for Otis and Maeve. He set up so many tunnels they eventually circled the room so that Otis could observe Thomas from several different angles. Observing something and loving it are quite different things. But as the process played out, Otis came to love Thomas. He loved how the little boy looked so peaceful as he slept snuggled in his bed in his half-moon print pajamas. He loved how Thomas greeted him each morning with missing front teeth. He even came to love the smell of a mixture of grass and earth and the soap Thomas's mother used to bathe him. Otis watched Thomas grow to a boy of five and then onwards to six. At night, before Thomas went to sleep, he would visit the gerbils and say, Good night, Otis. Arthur would join him and say, Good night, Otis, prince among gerbils. Incidentally, the gerbil knights of Abruzzo, who fight against the monsters from the dark woods, say a similar thing. They say, all is well on our watch. Gerbil Knight Otis is defender of the Thousand Realms. Or at least they might say that, if Otis would ever pass all the trials required to accede to their ranks. But we must not get ahead of ourselves, dear readers. Stories are always best if they are told in a linear route, beginning to end. As Grand Master Giotto always says to Otis when he tries to rush through the day's exercises, Otis, my boy? You must slow down. Take one thing at a time. Plan your steps carefully. Do not race around so much like a, well, a gerbil on caffeine. By the time Thomas turned 11, he and Otis were the best of friends, to the point where Otis allowed Thomas to carry him in his shirt pocket or in a shoebox lined with velvet. They became so close that Thomas began to take Otis outside to show his friends. Once he even took Otis to his school, which was horrifying. Hundreds of hands reached for him. I am rage, Otis roared, and again the humans heard nothing but a squeak, for humans are notoriously bad listeners. Over the next few years, there were more outings. There was a plethora of picnics and parties with just the five of them, Otis and Maeve, along with the human members of the family. During the picnic, Thomas would pass morsels to Otis, who grew fond of watercress sandwiches, pears, raspberry sherbet, and flaming hot Cheetos, among other things. On one of these occasions, as the entire family sat beside a babbling brook, Leanna began to sing. The sound was so entrancing that Otis stopped chewing his piece of lettuce and listened, his ears triangulating. 
After Liana finished, Maeve turned to Otis and squeaked a very strange thing. Otis, my heart, did you hear that? Music is more powerful than magic. I suspect you will learn this firsthand soon. Nothing has the ability to capture a being's emotions like a song. That is why Liana's mo- voice has moved you to tears. That night, Otis heard the song in his sleep as he snuggled close to his mother in the corner of their cage. Alleluia. Hallelujah. Otis squeaked the next morning, and Thomas leaned his head closer to the cage. Mother, come listen to this. I think he's singing. Deanna leaned her head close to the bars, but she heard only squeaks. Lupo returned a week later. He stood outside the imposing structure that, despite being named a tower, was more of a square. Normans, he said, and shook his head. They only know how to build in squares. Terrible for defense. Blind corners everywhere. Chiyoto ignored him. I must thank you for the dark liquid. The monks love it. Although Brother Armando claims it is the drink of a devil. But why have you brought this, this creature to me? Chiyoto eyed the freezing rodent that Lupo placed before him on the travertine step. She walks in circles. Something is wrong with her, Lupo. That is what the people who owned her said, and they tried to drown her, replied Lupo. Jota shot him a look which said, maybe they were right to do so. They were absolutely not right to do so, Lupo responded, as if hearing Jota's voice in his mind. She is strange, yes, some kind of neurological disorder. Jota gave him another look. Lupo, you speak in riddles. What is a neurological disorder? Ah, I forget, my dear Jota that you are a man confined by time. A neurological disorder is basically a disorder of the brain. Her brain doesn't function like yours or mine. Hers causes her to walk in circles. She cannot be a knight then. What are we supposed to do with her, cried Giotto. Her brain operates in a way we cannot understand. She is different and there is strength in that. Do not tell that to Donati, said Giotto. At the sound of the name of the Inquisitor sent from Rome, Lupo shuddered. Have you considered my request? Signor Alghieri is a man of unique talent. I do not know this Florentine of yours, but I fear for any man or rodent that wishes to descend into the depths of this tower. The levels are progressively worse until one is being roasted alive in the fires of Inferno, asked Lupo, not requiring any response. Dante is just the man to do it, survive, and tell us definitively what lies below. Giotto stroked his shaggy chin with his gray paw. Thoughtfully, he twisted his whiskers. Lupo, very few of the monks here even know about the stairs to the realms. And of the five of us who know, most of us believe it is a place best left alone. Why, just last month, a strange beast bubbled forth from its depths. The trap door is locked, and for the life of me, I cannot find the key. So you see, the being must have seeped from around its edges. Seeped from around its edges? Lupo had never heard of such a thing. Yes, Lupo, like a ve- vapor, seeped up from around the edges, and then congealed into a form of frightening proportions. If this is true, Giotto interrupted Lupo, the things are worse here than I thought. How long can you keep such creatures at bay? Certainly not much longer. If this is the kind of rodent you bring to me to be a future knight, Giotto gave a nod in the direction of the tiny gerbil. It was still turning in slow circles on the Traventine step. You surprise me, Giotto. A learned gerbil such as yourself, changing one of its own so quickly. Am I not the Giacatore? Do you not trust me? This little one is different, but 
she will be a source of strength when you least expect it. Chiyoto looked at the rodent. She was pitiful. Her ribs stood out and her half starved red. Very well, Lupo. What is her name? She has none. You must think of one, Chiyoto. She belongs to the order now. I shall call her Neve for the snow that falls this night, said Chiyoto, looking quite pensive. But now you must bring me gerbils of sharp minds and even stronger bodies. There is a crisis brewing. The French queen grows jealous of the Templar's powers. You have said so yourself, Lupo. I must have the fiercest of heart from now on no more. He looked at the tiny gerbil and swallowed. No more neurostaringly different rodents. Neurologically different, corrected Lupo. No more like this, Giotto pointed. You must bring me wars, even if they are not pure of heart. Are you sure, Giotto? I am, Lupo. You must be careful what you ask for. Lupo set his child firmly before departing. Otis had never seen anything as beautiful as the Garnet Library in Baltimore. When Thomas sat his shoebox down on the library table and subsequently removed its lid, Otis spun around slowly to take it all in. It was a room filled with old and rare leather books, paneled archways and parquet floors. Overhead, chandeliers sparkled over sofas and chairs upholstered in dark garnet. It was a dream of a space reminiscent of the Gilded Age that Otis had seen depicted in some of Arthur's many architectural books. Indeed, Arthur and his passion for architecture were the reason they were there. Currently, Thomas's father was high up on a rolling ladder that ran the length of the shelves. He was searching for what he described as the rarest of tomes, one needed for his research on architectural innovations of the 1850s. While he searched, Maeve climbed over the rim of the box, perched for a second, and then jumped off. Otis followed her lead, landing a second later on a glossy rosewood table that was slippery underfoot. Maeve was halfway across the table and sniffing the air knowingly, while Thomas busied himself with a crayon drawing of his thick family, being chased by something which vaguely resembled a mongoose. Otis decided to inspect the quality of Thomas's drawing and gave the small child a nod of approval. Wonderful perspective, Otis squeaked, and the subject matter truly inspired to appear. That mongoose is definitely of unnatural proportions. Well done. It's a hippopotamus, said Thomas, who, if he listened close enough to Otis's squeaking, was fairly certain he understood the rodent. Otis gave another nod, and a fine one at that. I'm gonna stop there, Cinderella, because I see you've fallen asleep. But anytime you want to hear the rest of the story, you can just leave me a comment. <laughs>